again and welcome to the rule of law and the new abnormal uh, here on Think Tech Hawaii. Um, my name's Benjamin Davis and I'm not in Hawaii. I'm in Charlottesville, Virginia, but uh, we're going to have a hopefully interesting program for all of you. Uh, our topic today uh, is the breathtaking week in American politics, looking at some of these things like uh, the political violence, violence in the rule of law, other societal violence, all these things are making up this fall a choice or change election. Uh, we'll discuss things like uh, the attempted assassination of President, uh, of former President Donald Trump, now the nominee, Judge Eileen Cannon's dismissal of the classified documents case, J.D. Vance, uh, who spoke last night at the Republican vice, as vice presidential nominee, and the Republican National Convention and anything else that comes across the minds of these wonderful guests that we have today. We have with us uh, David Larson, who's a professor at the uh, William Mitchell uh, Hamlin School of Law in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. And uh, we also have with us Jeff Portnoy, a wonderful First Amendment lawyer with a cage shooting. Uh, there in Hawaii. So you have uh, Charlottesville, Hawaii, and uh, St. Paul together uh, talking today. So uh, to start off, uh, we caught this title of a breathtaking week in uh, American politics. And I wondered if any of you had any sort of reactions to what you've been watching uh, daily almost right now. So how about David? Do you? Yeah, I think it was breathtaking. And um, there is a lot to talk about. But one of the most amazing things is I'm not sure how somebody could get 150 yards away from a presidential candidate and be able to sh attempt to assassinate former President Trump and nobody intercedes. Um, we are now getting reports that people had spotted this person on the roof um, and yet there wasn't an adequate response. And uh, the idea that we know we're very violent these days in our society, but the idea that um, somebody running for our highest office is that vulnerable is breathtakingly disturbing and frightening. Mm. And um, so that's certainly one of the events that, that I think should shock and worry all of us, the idea that um, somebody running for our highest office um, is that vulnerable? And we're talking inch or two, um, that kind of difference between killing that, killing former President Trump and wounding him. Um, so that's that's number one, the idea that that could happen. Um, it's not as though there haven't been assassinations of, of American presidents, it's been four, um, you know, so four out of 46. So, you know, violence is part of our, of our culture. Um, but one would hope that as we go through the years, we'd get a little better at preventing it. And again, uh, the fact that this person could get up on a rooftop so easily um, is very frightening. It's, it's kind of shades of Lee Harvey Oswald at the Texas Book Depository there almost. It's kind of eerie. How about you, Jeff? Any comments from this? what you've seen this week? Nothing good. <laughs> I mean, it's just been a horrible week. If you're not a mega Republican, uh, you know, the nomination of J.D. Vance, who can make Trump look like a liberal, is very, very disturbing. His views, although he's moderated them in the last 48 hours, are incredibly right wing and should be incredibly disturbing to. You would hope 60% of the country, uh, his image of this poor boy growing up in Appalachia. I read his book two years ago. It's a wonderful book. But obviously, in the last two years, as one of his former colleagues who uh, worked with him when he was an anonymous writer, has talked about on CNN in the last 24 hours, his transformation has been terribly scary. He will say anything or do anything to get ahead. And then you have the Democratic Party, which has never learned to stop eating its young. Uh, I mean, have they 
or maybe now eating their old. I don't know. Uh, it's it's just a terribly depressing time, and uh, you know, um, I really don't know what to say anyway, other than it's been a horrible week. Yes, you know, I agree with David. How could this have occurred? But you know what? I think it was just fortuitous that Trump's convention came up first. Because what we're learning is he was doing research into Biden and the Democratic convention. Mm -hmm. For some reason, this guy thought he could get away with killing both of them. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of unbelievable. So, uh, yes, tremendous breaches in the Secret Service. But, of course, the MAGA Republicans have now accused the Secret Service of having incompetent female Secret Service agents. It's just unbelievable how they can turn anything into a right-wing agenda, and it's very scary. I was listening to the, uh, the J.D. Vance's speech, and he was claiming that Biden was responsible for the Iraq war. It's like, don't you, Biden was not president then. Don't you kind of remember who was? Um, there was a Republican oh, you, you know, facts, facts don't have anything to do with what we've seen at the Republican convention. I mean, it's just unbelievable. If you read every day the fact-checking, it's one lie after another, one exaggeration after another. It doesn't matter who's talking. And if anybody needed to know the crazies that are in the Republican Party who spoke at this convention, like Green and others, it's unbelievable to me that people are still following uh, you know, Donald Trump. But they are in probably in increasing numbers, unfortunately. Well, you know, in 2024... You know, in our digital age, you know, visuals and optics are so important. And, you know, they're just exceeding substance. Kind <laughs> of breathtaking you know, right before us. And, you know, the visual images are capturing everybody's attention. And they're, and they're the basis for people's decision making um, and allegiances. So you see Trump raising his fist after getting nicked down the ear, you know, and and claiming fighting for all of America when when he when he suffers that wound, which again is a terrible thing, but the optic was you know I'm I'm doing this for you, and then right on the heels of that there's been a, a visual image of now that Biden is COVID he's even more frail than before, leaving Air Force One and going down the steps, looking so frail and weak, and so. So nobody's listening to the substance of the parties. And the Republican event, the National Convention isn't policy-based by any stretch of the imagination. So people are reacting to these, to these visual images, and they're powerful. And um, yeah. people are thinking that, um, yeah, Biden is as weak as everybody says he is. Look at look at him go down those steps. And, and Trump is as powerful as everybody says, because look, he just got wounded and raised his fist. So choice is easy for us. Um, and I'm not even going to pay attention to what either what stands for. I forget Project 2025. I'm not going to read that. Um, if you would read that, maybe you'd be shocked into into making a better decision. But they won't. So you know, right now we're being driven by these 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 images, and they're powerful. One of the things that uh, I thought could maybe be discussed was uh, the the head of the Teamsters coming to speak. And uh, there's been a certain line that's been presented that we are not the party of the bosses. We are the party of the workers. And I wondered, you know, to what extent you think that that message is actually going across uh, the people who are not in that room, you know? I believe the Teamsters have been most Republican candidates at least twice uh, in the last several decades. So I don't think this is something totally unique. And again, he didn't give him an endorsement publicly. Uh, I'm not sure his unions agree with him, uh, you know, his locals. Yeah. But, but look, the Democrats have lost any opportunity to get their message out. Any. The only message they get out every day is Biden's got to drop out. That's what we're hearing every single day, every single hour is more and more people are either leaking their views or stating them publicly. And Biden is just killing the Democrats, not only at the top of the ticket, 
but probably all the way down. I mean, you know, there's still, what, 100 plus days to go. But the polls show that he will suffer one of the massive, most massive defeats in the his recent history of presidential elections. And he's just too stubborn or too proud to step out. And I still think he will not be the nom he will not be the nominee. And they ought to do it by this weekend rather than a month from now. Dave, what do you think? If he doesn't withdraw, then he probably is going to be the nominee because he got so many delegates support the vast majority you know they're basically bound by the rules of the democratic national committee so i think he would end up being the nominee but as jeff's saying that i think it's well past the point that he's got to be more objective about what the probability is of him defeating trump and that's seems to be declining every day and um there's not many weeks before that convention and kind of better now than later, um, better right now than later. I mean, if you're going to change your candidate, you better do it as quickly as possible. Um, so, I'm, you know, there seems to be a little wavering. You know, now he's saying, well, first we're saying it had to be God. I'm not going to get out unless the God Almighty tells me. Now he's saying, well, I'll get out if a doctor tells me I should. The three gods, Pelosi and a former president. Yeah. Those are the three gods. And I don't know what they're doing right now, but the rumors are that at least two of them have made it pretty clear he's yeah. got to drop out. But Obama's thinking, we don't know yet. Uh, so a couple of things I wanted to, to kind of throw in the mix is the last time I remember a incumbent uh, not uh, going ahead was uh, Johnson. And at the time, I remember thinking it was all about the Vietnam War. And I was recently seeing some discussion that his real concern was with his own health, yeah. not so much with the Vietnam thing. And that's what prompted him to to say he was not going to run, and you know, the Chicago convention and all that stuff that happened. Biden, I could write his speech in which he steps down being a hero and all he has accomplished over his 50 years and his years as president going down item by item of all the great things. He could leave a hero. Johnson did not leave a hero. He was right. facing a Vietnam War. Biden can go out a hero to 40% of the country and maybe the other 35,000 votes that are necessary for them to win this election. And by the way, if he drops out and Kamala Harris becomes the president, if they nominate Shapiro of Pennsylvania as a vice presidential candidate, that puts Pennsylvania back in the Democratic camp. There's a lot of political reasons for him to drop out. Let me ask a, a, a question a different way. Um, are you at all disturbed, uh, if I could say, or bothered by, let's call it the powers that be in the Democratic Party doing this process of trying to get him to resign after all the primary voting that's happened by ordinary citizens. In other words, it, 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 it's, it's sort of like, you remember the old smoke-filled room vision of uh, the nomination process that probably 50 years ago? Does, does any of that kind of strike you? It's interesting because the rules of the Democratic National Committee have been changed. To, we had superdelegates before that people felt had too much power in terms of the nomination. So the rules have been changed, actually, to kind of lessen the power of individuals and try and turn more to the, to, to the general population. So that's been the trend. So, so the idea that there are some individuals trying to exercise their greater influence is a little inconsistent with that theme. But conditions change. You know, there's a, there's a lot about context. You know, mm -hmm. and this is a kind of an extraordinary context um, on a timeline. So, am I bothered by that? Um, kind of given the evolution of the rules? No, I, I'm not personally. And it, to kind of follow what Jeff was saying, it would not be inconsistent. There's another thing that would be consistent if Biden were to withdraw at this point, and that's his statement when he was running for president that he was a transition president that he was going to, you know, go and he, he thought he could beat Trump and he did. And, um, you know, and then he could, he could move forward with a more progressive agenda. And then he would be passing the baton on to another generation. 
So if we were to withdraw now, it would be simply that I'm following what I said I was going to do. Um, you know, I had a very productive four years, and here's all the things we accomplished. We don't want to backpedal, and that's what's going to happen. If we have a change in our administration, um, and this is what I promised to do, and I'm doing it now. And I think there are two things, one that could have been changed and another one that couldn't to answer your question. One, I think they hit him all during the first six months of this year. They were able to do that. Uh, you know, whatever kind of frailties, physical and mental, he was having were kind of kept under wraps. But over the last couple of months where he's had to get out on a daily basis and, you know, it's just so obvious, even to people like myself who think he's been a great president, I, I cringe when I watch him walking and talking. And of course, you know, it's become the meal of the day and the media doesn't care what he says, right? He can give a 20 minute interview and 18 minutes are brilliant. They will pick on the fact that he said, you know, Trump was his vice president. I mean, he's getting older by the minute and it's showing. And that I think was unanticipated two or three months ago. And don't forget, we're not just looking at What's his condition now or in November? What's he going to be like three or four years from now? I, I think that's the scary thing. You know, I think that also plays into why, well, Trump picked Vance probably for a number of reasons. One is that he's, you know, he will do anything that Trump says uh, for the first reason. But he's, he's half of Trump, literally one half of Trump's age. So they can trot him out at the convention and, um, you know, 39 years old. Um, you know, the third and, youngest vice presidential candidate. Yeah, yeah, energetic, um, looks young, you know, and, and the Republicans wanted to paint that contrast. Um, you know, look at look at our best presidential candidate, look at your presidential candidate. What do you think? Um, you know, don't even don't you don't even need to listen to him. And if you did listen to his speech, you know, he was very careful to back off some of these very extreme positions he's taken in the past and was careful not to do the same thing and talked about his background, um, you know, growing up in a, in a more challenged environment. I grew up in a lower income community. When I read his book, I think it's, it's you know, people were critics were saying, oh, what a great book. So it's like, I was like, we live this stuff every day. It's, there's nothing insightful about it at all. This is ridiculous. This is the most ridiculous book I've ever read. You know, yeah. My wife and I just were laughing at it. This is insane. You know, the only people who are saying it's so insightful are people have no idea who didn't live that life. So, you know, I discounted that book. I thought it was ridiculous and that anybody in my town could have read that. Um, but he, he's kind of leaning on that, the idea that I grew up in, in kind of these challenging environment. And so I'm like you. Um, so don't read or care or listen about anything I've said in the past. Just identify with me and trust that I will have your best interests uh, at heart. And I don't think you will. So um, there's been a lot of talk at the uh, Republican convention post the assassination attempt on unity, on talking about unity. So do you think Trump tonight is going to be Mr. Unifier? Uh, and is that unifier of Republicans or unifier of America? Right now, I think Trump will be that person tonight. He knows he's way in the lead, and all he can do is screw it up. So he'll make this, you know, what a wonderful country this is and how God saved my life. And, you know, and we'll see how long that lasts. But I think tonight, I don't have any intention to watch it or even listen to it. Uh, but I think you're right. I think he's going to give this America speech. And, you know, but, you know, if he goes off the teleprompter, who knows what... Yeah what what he'll do but i mean he doesn't look so happy either frankly at the convention i mean i know he's been shot in the ear but he doesn't look very robust either so yeah. I mean, you watch him walking around he's like in a daze and you know that smile doesn't look real i mean so i can understand why if you come within an inch of losing your life obviously even with trump it has to have a profound effect but I don't think his psychological state of mind has been analyzed very well. Yeah, he may be on, on painkillers too. I figure with that ear like shot up like that, they'd be giving him painkillers. That's what we're seeing. I don't know. Could be. 
you know. But um, so maybe to switch gears a little bit, how what did you think about uh, Judge Cannon uh, dropping her dismissal of the classified documents, ninety three page decision? I think on Monday. That was that. Anybody surprised, David, by the that? Fact that she would, the fact that she would do anything she could to kind of derail that case, that's not a surprise. <laughs> Any, you know, anything she could to, 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 to dismiss it, which she did, or slow it down, she has done. So, um, you know, it's the, that, whole, that whole thing is a mystery. How in God's name she ever got that assignment after already being chastised by the appellate court and then somehow getting this case on a second circulation, it just doesn't seem possible. Um, just don't blame her. Look what John Roberts did in our favorite justice, Clarence Thomas has said, and she's marching in lockstep with Clarence Thomas and the Federalist Society. Right. Hopefully the, the appellate court will reverse it, but by that time, Trump may well be president, so we're wasting a lot of time. I think what's curious is how come no one has talked about Biden's special prosecutor? Hunter no, Biden. Biden. How come he's still out there? Yeah. I, I don't get it. <laughs> very, very good point. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Uh, it's been a bad week, Ben. It's a bad week. Any Anything that making you feel like it, it uh, optimistic a little? Optimistic. Don't look at me. I can't really? think. You think no? Well, you know... The stock market is doing wonderfully well, although nobody seems to be paying enough attention to that. Um, you know, there's a lot of economic indicators that are quite good. Inflation is still low. Um, it's going lower all the time. Uh, really, there's a lot of objective indices that are quite promising. But as Jeff mentioned earlier, that that message is not being communicated very effectively. And... Um, you know, instead of talking all the time about whether Biden should be withdrawing, we should be talking about more of the successes of this administration. And they're continuing right now. They We, we were at 41,000 in the Dow um, yesterday, which is unprecedented. Um, so there are good things happening, but again, they're not making the headline. So, you know, there's a thing that's been called uh, the convention bump. Um, every once in a while that, you know, basically both uh, whenever a party has its convention, it usually has its uh, uh, its poll numbers go up. So is this maybe uh, Trump peaking too soon? I think there's an assassination bump. I don't think it's going to be the convention. I think the convention has been overwhelmed by what happened, you know, Sunday. I think what's interesting, I guess if you have to look for something that's optimistic, is really how close the polls are. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah, the, the news isn't good that in 14 states, you know, he's, he's dropped a point or two. But you would think with all that's gone on in the last three weeks that there'd be a massive shift. And I think what it shows, guys, is what we've talked about before and over and over. The country has 40% that are going to vote for whoever the Democrat is, and 40-plus percent are going to vote whoever the Republican is. And we're dealing with such a small number of people who either hate both of them and may not vote or are going to make a last-minute decision. So if I'm looking for any optimism, it's that I would have thought the polls would be much worse and we'll see what happens this next week when the assassination polls come out and the post uh, convention polls come out. But I still, maybe it's wishful thinking. I think Biden's out by the weekend. Let's see if we covered everything I had on our list. Uh, just going back to it here, just to make sure. Uh, let's see. Overall, do you think that the Republican National Convention is a positive experience for people watching it or are they, are people being <laughs> scared by what they're watching and seeing you can go david i haven't watched any <laughs> yeah well you know it's, i've watched some of it i gotta say it wasn't particularly exciting you know it's, it's, a, watch. it's not it's, during the day here so it's a good it's, excuse <laughs> yeah well it's, you know it's not really you know prime, <laughs> it's like prime time television it's it's not very inspiring by any stretch of the imagination 
So how's the music? How's the music been? Has the music been good? I mean, look who the look who the speaker is that's going to introduce Trump tonight. You want to talk about America? Dana White. Right. For those who don't know, he's the, you know the uh, fighting guy who's been accused of sexual harassment and all kinds of other things. Was driven out of the company he founded because of his conduct, and he's giving the speech to introduce Trump. What else do you need to know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One thing I did notice last night when I was watching was that people were holding up these signs that said mass deportations now. OK. And I was looking at that like, hmm. So um, they're, they're hearkening back to Eisenhower's. Uh, it was called Operation Wetback. I'm letting you know where 1.3 million Mexicans, some of them actually were Americans, were deported then. And then I noticed in some reading that, it, you know, back with FDR during the 30s, there were these kinds of deportations. That's a good thing they're going to be deported because they've taken all the black jobs. Yeah, that's it, like this right, one. Ben? <laughs> <laughs> it's taking all the black jobs. So, so, you know, the African-Americans are going to be very happy they can have those jobs back. Right. So... I, you know, I, apparently there are 11 million undocumented people in the United States. And so I went on a world population list and tried to figure out what are the populations of how many countries that are 11 million or less. OK, and it starts at number 81 going down to number 192. So it's literally populations of about 110 countries that are talking about deporting from the United States. By the way, it was done with the military back in uh, the 50s. You think that there'll be any reaction to all that or people will be standing around in glee or, you know, like the collaborationists uh, in France during World War II, happy to see somebody's house go so they could take it or, you know, the Japanese American stuff back in the day. You know, how do you think we're going to react to that kind of thing? I'm not I'm not counting on the courts at this point. I'm not counting on the courts to actually say maybe stop. OK. Well, you know, you mentioned it, it, uh, it's convention inspiring, you know, to the degree that the Republican Party has become a party of, of, of a person, you know, the call word cult has been used, that it's really, it, it's really an emotionally driven, not a, not an objectively driven party. Um, so if that's what you are, if you're, if you're party that's driven by emotion, and now you have an attempted assassination, that's going to ramp up your emotion even higher. So um, right now, there, there is this question of emotion that, you know, that's what's driving us to begin with. That's really appealing to some of our darkest desires, unfortunately, when it comes to hatred and oppression and discrimination, kind of endorsing it, saying it's okay to be that person. So we're embracing that a little bit. And then, you know, our, then our leader... Um, kind of survives an assassination attempt to prove how strong that person is. And that's all kind of culminating in this kind of even stronger, not intellectual, but emotional response. And that's that's building. Um, so uh, I think that's what's happening at that convention. It's just yeah. spiraling up in terms of this kind of emotional um, response. But, you know, with regards to the spiraling up there, uh... You know, there's the idea of the leader, right, or the leadership principle uh, that sometimes used to be talked about of uh, really having uh, this maybe not be looked at as a nominating convention, but a coronation kind of convention. Um, I wonder if you're feeling anything like that, that, you know, that's really a coronation that's going on more than a nomination with regards to what he's doing. You look at Project 2025, you know, where they're trying to change the presidency to more of a monarchy, you'd say that, well, yeah, we are kind of trending towards a coronation. Um, if you're embracing that idea that democracy is no longer desirable or necessary, um, and we're going to move towards another model of government, um, yeah, that is moving towards a coronation. Well, I mean, look, it is a cult. There's no two ways about it. It's a cult. It's driven by one man. And his views are unimportant. It's him. 
And you have to give them tremendous credit, you know? I mean, uh, there have been a few other world leaders who have been cults. It hasn't gone very well for those nations. But he's a cult. And you're right. I mean, you know, whether you call it a nomination or a coronation, it's four days to celebrate Donald Trump. And, you know, if he hadn't been involved on Sunday, it would have been the same thing. It just ramped up because there he is with that thing on his ear. And maybe you've seen a few pictures today. Tonight, there's going to be a whole ton of people with bandages on their ears. They're already out there. I mean, how crazy is that? That's not a political convention. That's a cult. If well, Colton told those people at that convention to lie down in the middle of a highway, 10% of them would probably do it. I mean, it's, it's just unbelievable. Well, I just saw a wag online that said all these folks who couldn't be made to wear a mask are now willing to put a maxi pad on their ear. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. We'll try to end this with a chuckle. So everybody out there, whatever it is that you how you feel and uh, about the, the state of America or where you're at, my encouragement is uh, that you stay stay active and don't despair and do your best and whatever you can do to make the place where you're at as, as good as possible. It has been a breathtaking week. And uh, with such a breathtaking week, uh, gives us a lot to think about. Uh, and Lord knows we still have got a few more months till November to see what kind of other craziness can happen. So on that note, I'd like to thank you, Jeff, and thank you, Dave for being part of this one today. And uh, uh, I'm not in Hawaii, but I understand I should say mahalo. So mahalo, and I wish you all the best. Mm -hmm.